today I am hosting some amazing speakers who can help you plan, budget, and execute your home improvement project in a safe way. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what our office does and then I'm going to turn it on over to um, Dave Finneran from the Maryland Home Improvement Commission. Commission. And following that will be Tom Huskins. He's from the Department of Inspections, Permitting and Licensing, Licensing and Permitting. I had it backwards, sorry. Um, we also have uh, Taylor Shelton from Department of Housing and Community Development, and also um, Marsha White from Rebuilding Together, um, who will talk about um, ways that you can um, help pay for your home improvement project. So the Office of Consumer Protection um, uh, is a dispute resolution is our number one um, mission. And so we do a lot of work with uh, home improvement complaints. Um, we also do a lot of outreach. And so we have a flyer here on, you know, on common home improvement scans. Um, for folks that are here in the audience, please stop off at the tables because um, there's some really good useful information and our host, the library, thank you so much for hosting us. They've actually put out some great books that you can check out, but they also have a program, which I don't know if folks know, where you can rent tools from the libraries, which is like an amazing resource. Um, the first thing I will say is that it is now home improvement season, which is why we've invited these amazing speakers today. You are gonna get folks coming door to door, uh, whether it's windows or siding or uh, solar panels or hey, you know, there's a squirrel that ran into your attic or uh, I have some leftover materials which no good contractor will ever have leftover materials. Anyone who's knocking on your door needs to have our license. So if anyone knocks on your door to sell you anything, ask them for the, home, uh, the solicitor or peddler's license that we issue. They can't show it to you if they say it's back at the office or the company has it. We license the person, not the company. So they have to be able to show you that license. And so if that is your first line of defense, ask for the peddler or solicitor license that we issue. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to David Finner from the Maryland Home Improvement Commission. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. I am Dave Finneran. I'm the director of the Maryland Home Improvement Commission. Uh, we administer the home improvement laws of Maryland and regulate contractors and salespeople that, that do perform home improvements. Uh, home improvement will be uh, any renovation, any uh, work that you have done on your house that doesn't include another licensing, uh, licensing category, such as electricians, plumbers, HVAC contractors, are all licensed uh, separately. But any of the painting and the drywall, if you do concrete work, even outside the house, siding, roofing, um, would all fall under home improvement. And in that case, a, a contractor that performs that work or enters into a contract with you would, would be required to hold a home improvement license. Uh, we shorted that up for MHIC license, Maryland Home Improvement Commission. I have a staff of 20, um, we have 32,000 plus licensed contractors in the state and a little over 3,000 licensed salespeople. So the folks that come to your home, if they negotiate to sell a home improvement contract, they're required to hold a salesperson license. Um, so let me start. I, I'd like to ask, start by asking a question. Has anybody had any home improvements done recently um, has anybody, show of hands, anybody had maybe a bad experience with a contractor in the past or a miserable relative that has? Um, there's going to be a few of you, but we're going to try to make it at the end of this and hopefully the any experience you have in the future is going to be a better experience. So we're going to see if we can teach you a little bit about home improvement. Our goal is to safeguard the consumer rights of homeowners. Our mission is to foster professionalism and a high quality of workmanship throughout the industry. Uh, so choosing a contractor, the contractors will come because we have such a broad category of, of work that, could, that would fall under home improvement license, you're going to want to find a contractor that fits your particular project. You wouldn't want to use a painting contractor who specializes in painting to do a flooring job or uh, that kind of, or a roofing job, things of that nature. So you're going to try to find a contractor that fits your um, project. 
uh, prepares to chop, you want to, the best situation would be to get some uh, advice from a relative or somebody that you know that's had experience with a particular contractor, somebody that could recommend one. Um, you can also go out and get some estimates for yourself. You'll feel more comfortable with more estimates, more information. Uh, the contractor will, will describe the job to you, each one that comes by the house. So you get up to three estimates and you'll feel better about the uh, project when you get started. Uh, it's not necessary for you to pay for an estimate. Uh, estimates should be free. Um, let's, let's, let's try to find some estimates that, that are, make sense that are free. Uh, let's, let's start there. Be aware that the lowest estimate may not always be the best value for your project. Uh, if a contractor has the skills needed, sometimes that contract will be higher than, than the lowest estimate. Uh, quality of materials is going to be important as well. So you're going to want to use, uh, discuss quality of materials. You're going to want to make sure they're specified in the contract uh, so you know what you're getting. Um, ask to see the contractor's license. Uh, just because the contractor says they're licensed, um, we know from our complaint history that, that they aren't always licensed. Um, we want to uh, confirm that. You're going to start by asking for the contractor's license, follow that up with a phone call to anybody, any one of my staff, and they'll look in the, in the records to make confirm that they do they are holding up an active license. Um, so enter into go ahead. a public database. Somewhere. There is a public database. There's a search field in our, our website. If you Google MHIC, you'll find our website as um, pretty close to the top. And there's a search field you can you can do it, but it doesn't always give you the full story. You can get a little more information by calling us. You can get the complaint history, how long they've been in business, an important feature, and uh, and make sure they are properly licensed. Um, if you do hire a licensed contractor, you have the protections of home improvement law. Uh, home improvement law will, if you have a problem with that contractor, if they do unsatisfactory or insufficient or abandon the home improvement job altogether, we have a guarantee fund that will pay you back for any actual loss caused by a licensed contractor. If it's an unlicensed contractor, we don't have those uh, tools. Uh, we would uh, have to address it a different way, and I'll talk about unlicensed contractors here in a minute. Um, all right, so verbal contracts. Let's, let's don't enter into a verbal contract. Uh, the contractor, uh, let's get him get the contractor to, to sit down with you, just have a lot of discussion about the project so you know what the scope of the project is, and then let's find a written contract and let's sign that contract and, give your, and make sure you have a copy of that. Uh, you may even want to have an attorney look at that contract, especially for the more complicated jobs, just to make sure that um, it's, your, your rights are covered. And I see right on the bulletin board over here, they have a, a, a flyer up there for uh, legal services. So there's some help uh, if, if you need it um, through some legal aid services. Um, the contract must include, uh, let's, let's make sure the total amount paid is on that contract, uh, the payment schedule. Let's make sure you, if it's a larger pay, a larger project, you want to set up a draw schedule where you, uh, you, you're paying the contractor as the project moves along. You don't want the money to get too far ahead of the project. Uh, if it's a larger project, you don't want to pay for it all in full up front. Um, actually, home improvement law, it's, it's, it is, uh, we limit the amount of money that a contractor can take at the time of signing to a maximum of one third. So one third of the deposit at the time of signing is the maximum. That's a negotiable number. It doesn't have to be a third, it could be less. Um, but a reasonable pay payment schedule, uh, agree to start and finish dates. Uh, put these dates in the contract. They're gonna be approximate. There are things that happen. There's permits that, that'll hold you up. There'll be uh, building material issues. There'll, there could be uh, you know labor labor struggles, but let's, and weather. So let's, let's put some approximate start and finish dates in that uh, contract so everybody knows how that project should progress. Uh, I don't expect you're going to be spelling out all your expectations so both parties are aware of it. Um, and then after you sign the contract, there's a, 
even a signed contract, and even after you've given a deposit, the Door to Door Sales Act allows you to cancel a home improvement contract five days. You may cancel this transaction at any time prior to midnight of the fifth business day or midnight of the seventh business day if the buyer is 65 years old or, or older after the after the day of the transaction. So, um, you know, if, if you rushed into something, the salesman um, sold you a project that, that you had second thoughts about, you have that, that chance to cancel. Uh, so now, complaint side, if, if you have a contractor that did not perform well, uh, it was a little uns it was unsatisfactory, unworkmanlike. It, it wasn't up to the standards of the industry. Uh, you can file an MHIC complaint. Well, we ask you keep the lines of communication open with your contractor. You can avoid a lot of complaints just by good communication. Um, and after you decided that it's time to file a complaint, go ahead and uh, request a complaint form from my staff, or you can go online and download a complaint form. We need your original signature on that, so you're going to have to mail that into us or, or bring it into the office uh, directly. Um, we want a copy of your contract, uh, your methods of payment, uh, photos. Tell us what the situation is. Uh, that is the homeowner side of the story, that complaint. Now, we're going to send that complaint to the contractor, and we're going to ask the contractor, order the contractor to respond to get their side of the story. And then it goes to an investigator to try to mediate that, that uh, situation. Um, worst case, it ends up going to a hearing if everybody's dug in and we can't get any forward progress. Um, I but mean, like statutes of limitations. There are statutes of limitations, so not to file a complaint. Anybody can file a complaint, but uh, the second step in the complaint, after you've got a complaint, you've sent it to the investigator, the investigator says, yeah, that this looks like a violation of home improvement law. We're going to send it to a hearing. Well, a hearing is a claim hearing. So the second step is to file a claim against the, the uh, guarantee fund. We have a fund that's uh, funded to repay the contract the homeowners that have an actual loss due to the acts of a contractor. And we uh, would ask you to file a claim form. It's very similar, but you have to back up your claim at this point. We're asking you to prove that you paid the money so you have an actual loss and to talk and get a uh, obtain a um, an estimate or proposal or contract from another licensed individual, licensed contractor, licensed engineer, someone who's licensed in the industry is considered an expert in the industry, and you're going to want to get that estimate and send that in to support your claim. And then we push it forward to a hearing. So that's that's the second step of that. Um, So that, that guarantee fund is supported by licensed contractors. They all pay into the fund. Um, that uh, fund is is compensation to anybody that does have an actual loss. The maximum recovery from the guarantee fund is $30,000 per claimant. So a homeowner that has a $40,000 loss would be limited to collect from our fund a maximum of $30,000. So that uh, or it's actually limited by the amount of money that you actually paid the homeowner, the contractor. If you only paid the contractor twenty thousand dollars, you can't collect thirty. You can't uh, obtain a profit from the guarantee fund. Um, so contracts also can have an arbitration clause in them. If, if you're uh, negotiating that contract, there's a contractor. Uh, that puts an arbitration clause in there as, as a dispute resolution method. So they'll, if it's a binding arbitration clause, it will force you to go to arbitration before you can file a claim against the guarantee fund. So you'd have to go to uh, get a ruling from the arbiter before we can move forward with that claim. So an unlicensed contractor. So. Probably a third of all of our complaints against unlicensed contractors. Homeowners aren't aware that, that, that the benefits of using a, a licensed contractor uh, might be a little cheaper to use an unlicensed contractor, but in the long run, it, it could cost you. You don't have the benefit of the Home Improvement Guarantee Fund. Um, there's no real strong method to get your money back. If an unlicensed contractor comes in and takes a deposit and does no work, um, we can file criminal charges against that contractor, but we're going to have to have 
the contractor's identity. We're going to have to get a positive ID on that contractor. And we have to have a willing witness, a homeowner that's willing to go testify in court, in criminal court, against an unlicensed contractor. Um, and then the judge can or, or has the option to award a restitution to the homeowner that the contractor may or may not have the money. So uh, let's use the licensed contractor. Strong argument for using the law, licensed contractor. Um, and that is the end of this, my narrative. But I, I do have some handouts uh, available from MHIC. You can order them, uh, call our office, we'll send them to you. They include 10 tips for choosing a contractor, and I have some in the back of the room as well. Uh, really quickly decide which home improvements uh, you want to make for your home. Seek licensed contractors. Obtain more than one estimate. Ask them to show their home improvement license to you. <coughs> Verify their license with our website or at our office. Check the contractor's complaint record. Request references from the contractor. We didn't talk about that. And choose a contractor who's right for you. Always use get a written contract, no verbal contracts. And request to see the building permit. Uh, the building permit uh, is an important part of that project to make sure that the, the work's done correctly. Uh, we have a warning letter that we can just uh, send you as well. Uh, it just tells you that uh, liability insurance is an important part of this. All licensed contractors do have liability insurance for any consequential damage. If they drop paint on your floor or run over your light pole when they're backing in the driveway, the liability insurance claim would be the way to recover that money. Uh, and then, <coughs> Building permits. We do also require that they put their MHIC number, license number, on their vehicles. So uh, look on their vehicles as a way to, to verify, help verify that they have a, a contract, contract with license. Um, and then this pink core card uh, just tells you a little bit about what should be on a contract about deposits and payments and, and the door to door sales act. Uh, the Department of Labor has. Uh, occupational professional licensing has 24 boards and commissions that license anyone from cemeteries to electricians to plumbers. Um, and uh, just make sure you use a licensed home improvement individual. And Tracy, I think that does it for me. And I want to try to throw the baton to somebody else. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So there's a, we have two minutes high for questions. Contractor, like general contractor, uh, whatever. There certainly are. In, in, uh, in building contractors, there's the commercial contractor who is basically unregulated. There's not an agency that regulates commercial contracting. Uh, they do have to get a, a commercial license, though. It's more of a registration. Uh, there's home improvement contractors, new home builder, uh, registration unit. They, reg they license home new home contractors. And then there's a marine contractor license that licenses anybody that's close to the shore uh, doing riprap, piers, docks, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So, and then subcontractors are unlicensed. Uh, they, do, they do hold a, a business license, but they aren't uh, regulated by an agency as well. So subcontractors are the responsibility of the contractor. So we hold the contractor responsible. The subcontractors are uh, hopefully the contractors are vetting their kind of subcontractors and, and hiring people that have the skills they need. So we also talk about the plumbers and electricians, HVAC, because those, are, those yeah. are different boards. Yeah, that's the more like a trade license. I'm talking about like a general contractor. So they have to, I guess there will be a, some kind of written test in order to get a license? There or is. just register? And well, home improvement contractors do uh, do take a test, so do the salespeople. It's based on home improvement law. It's not based on the skills to work on a job. So they're, they're learning about the law and they have to prove that, that they understand the law and that's part of the testing process. So um, do they have to renew like every couple of years? They do. Get so a license? Correct, yeah, you get your original license and then it's a, a two year renewal period for both contractors and salespeople. And do they have to go through some kind of legal or, or any updating trainings? Uh, I mean, and do no. you get some, or are they just automatic pay the money in? <laughs> it's, it's paid the money. Uh, we, we look at their conduct both at the original application and, and things, see if there's any kind of uh, legal issues that, that would restrict them from having a license. And then uh, liability insurance has to be updated. So. so do you have different type dollar amount of liability or do you just say you need to have minimum 
example, that's, that's a great question because there's a law going through uh, right now, and actually, I think it was just signed as of maybe yesterday that increased the liability insurance minimum to five hundred thousand dollars per contract. So every contractor must have a five dollars, five hundred thousand dollars general liability. That's per company, right? That's for company, yes. If they're signing a contract as an individual or a company, either way, they need to have that same $500,000 worth. So the reason is sometimes the contractor, they, they have maybe one person, two person, five person, you know. It's ahead of the person who hold a license, mean 500000 or. The <laughs> licensed individual, which can be we can we can license the individual, or we can license the individual and the company. Either case, both of those or all, both of those or the individual are, are licensed. Um, hold, they do hold. They are insured. They have, they must be insured. Yeah, there was some kind of liability issue, and then so you were saying they increased to five hundred thousand. So yes, that's a minimum, right? That's correct. And most most policies I I see them every day are, are a million. Mm -hmm. uh, most insurance agents just write for a million. But 500 will be the minimum limit, correct? The state And law. it is right now. Um, I actually, I think it's being signed into law in July, but yes. I it mean, was the passed reason it. is that when you want to interview a contractor, they say, if they don't know, they say, oh, I'm insured, they say, how much? Sometimes yeah. you want to know whether the guy sure. is actually. And you can ask them to give you a certificate of insurance. Sir. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't, they supposed to carry it? And that's still no, no, no. They wouldn't carry it, but they could give it to they you. They um, furnish it to you as part of the contract. Sure. Oh, okay. That was a contract for most of the Oh, I don't know. I have no idea what uh, how to deal with contractor. We just take the okay. I'm I'm licensed. Okay, and then we just so trust it. You, you want proof? I yeah. The one thing I, I will say, and this I ran into quite a bit um, in years past. Just because they give you an MHIC number doesn't mean it's theirs. And so a lot of times, oh, they um, can borrow someone else. They can't. Not legally. Not legally, but that's it. So if someone gets fired, they might take the boss's MHIC number and run with it. So whenever you see a number, run it through a search on MHIC's website and make sure that Smith Contracting is pitching you that number belongs to Smith Contracting and not Jones Contracting. You know what I mean? You might be worried about an unlicensed contractor instead of a licensed Yeah, and that's the number one way you know you have an unlicensed contractor, and this is a good segue to Tom, is they say it's a lot cheaper if you pull the permit than if I pull the permit. Because Tom's the agency will not give a license, will not give a permit to an unlicensed contractor unless you can talk about home, the homestead exception. Yeah. And, and our law says that the, the contractor must ensure that a, a permit is on the job if the permit's required. It doesn't say who has to, he, Tom can talk about who, how to pull a permit, but it doesn't yeah. say that the contractor must pull the permit, but it just says they must ensure that it's on the job. Oh, so yeah. it could be a home so architect or whoever. The permit go in and Permits required. It has to be there. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you can pull the permit. My uh, okay. Or apply for per. It, when you say pull, does that mean apply? Oh, apply. I'm sorry. And then sometimes they have a requirement, like you require to have a proof print. Uh, I'm going to leave that up to the next office. I, I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, if you get overwhelmed, then uh, right. then the homeowner say, okay, you can take care of that. Yeah. So, yeah, so no the question is that I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I do have a question. Like, for you to tell, are there pictures of what an official license looks like on a website or something? Uh, it certainly has the state seal. Is there a picture? I don't believe I've ever seen a picture on the website, but it would have the state seal in the middle of it. Um, and it's got a signature of the governor on it, and it would have a license number. Uh, okay. it, it's a pretty official looking document, so I, I don't. Well, it might be helped, like. I, I like to, that. to like put a picture because we don't know. Like they can show us this. But again, that's, say, that's this how you my license. Yeah, I would request, ask you to follow up with one of my staff members to make sure. But then, like we're in the middle of the negotiations. I, I guess, exactly. You got five days to cancel, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, it's a recommendation <laughs> so that we can be more informed like, before like, we go talk good. to contract. All right. Is there any other questions? All right, folks, I thank you very much, and I'm going to pass the court. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Huskins. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tom Huskins. I've been around this business a long time. I'm old, as everybody can tell. Uh, you know, I'm 
for the day. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've been a home builder for 30 years. I've been in the home building business and the building business. And my oldest son still runs those businesses. They've been around since 1973. Um, any, anyway, uh, you know, I, I'm the enforcement, inspection and enforcement side of the business. I have a group of uh, like 34 inspectors who inspect the building, the plumbing, electric, uh, HVAC, the mechanical, uh, fire protection, and the rental housing inspections. Uh, my cohort here, Amanda, she is the inspection side, of the permitting side of the business. I'm, I'm the guy that has to deal with the public and the contractors. Uh, and it's, most of the time it's very pleasant, and sometimes it's not. Uh, but when, when you're hiring a contractor, you know, always get referrals, you know, in my opinion. You know, if you, get, you, know, if you have a friend that used a contractor, get that friend to give you, I mean, the contractor to give you a price. And get several prices, as Dave said. Uh, the more knowledgeable you are, the easier it is. And, and you know, I find, you know, in Howard County, we've got a lot of good contractors. And uh, most of them follow the laws, and we have the exceptions every once in a while. And uh, that's when uh, Tracy steps in. Uh, but, you know, it's a, uh, you know, we expect, we want people to treat us like we would treat them. Most contractors do. Most of them want to do a good job, get done and get out of get paid, make their living, go for it. Uh, you know, uh, it said we, in Howard County, we do about 300 inspections a day for a small group of people. So it's quite active, quite busy. Uh, like I said, it's about 34 inspectors and five supervisors. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's hectic, we're busy, and most of us enjoy the job. Uh, but again, you know, the enforcement side of the business is the unpleasant side. You know, we have a building contractor, if he's building new houses, home addition renovation, which requires the MHIC license. You know, they want to be efficient, get that job in get done so they uh, when we come out and inspect the job uh, if we fail an inspection or something you know we go by an international residential code uh, we're on the 2021 version right now uh, and it's, been, it's uh, updated every three years uh, and all our inspectors qualify for to be inspectors and maintain that our building uh, excuse me our plumbing electrical and hvac inspectors are all mastered uh, Contractors, formerly most of them, have a master's license and a master inspector's license as well. And so they know what they're doing, they go out the job. And what I was getting at, when we fail an inspection, the contractor fixes it right away because he wants to keep that project moving. And if he doesn't, we have enforcement mechanisms. You know, we can write a notice of violation to the contractor, even to the homeowner of the, where the project is. Uh, most contractors wouldn't want us to notify the homeowner that we're sending a notice violation, so they uh, correct the, the violation and move forward. So can um, you pause yeah. right there? Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm stuck in who? So it sounds like there's a process for like closing out a permit. Correct. There's a, a beginning, beginning and inspection and a final. When that doesn't happen. Is that, does that fall on the contractor or the homeowner? Falls on the homeowner. I tell you why That's it falls really on. unfortunate. <laughs> well, we go after the contractor first to try and get it completed. It falls on the homeowner because we own the, own the project. Sometimes as I start to get to, we issue a notice violation, we get the contractor X number of days to perform. And most inspections, let me back up. Most inspections we go out if we fail to contact or fixes immediately, it's an oversight, something they didn't know, or just a flat out mistake and it's fixed. Uh, if they don't fix it, we can go to enforcement action, which is rare from the number of inspections we do. But when we do go to enforcement action, we go to notice of violation and go to the homeowner or the contractor. Or or and or, it's or, not or. Not and. We, so, we send it to the homeowner, we copy the contractor. The reason we send it to the homeowner, because there's a $250 a day fine involved. And homeowner gets that contract and moving, but we contact the con contractor is copied and we contact him first or her. And and that, that gets moving because we tell them $250 a day fine if you look at this result. Uh, 
they had the option of paying a fine it accumulates one fifty dollars a day very fast and they have the option to go to court and might get 15 days to resolve it. and if they're moving forward we'll extend it and give them more time <clears throat> but if it doesn't get resolved we go to court uh, we have people in court every day and <coughs> excuse me <coughs> But when we go to court, then it's up to the judge. We have fines. Uh, might be, you know, if they resolve, I'm sorry. What type of court is it? Uh, district court in the state of Maryland. Oh. Well, I just can't. Yeah, right, right in the heart of the county. So it's a district court, okay. Yes, it's official court. We don't go to arbitration, we go to court. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you know, licensing is a little bit different issue and so forth, you know. And the license contract, if they pay a fee, that goes to a guaranteed fund, I assume it's still that way. Uh, but, you know, but when we take a contract to the court and the judge rules on it, he might give them 30 days to wrap this up, or I'm going to, it's going to cost you $6,000 out of that $10,000 fine that we're up to. And then, so, are those public records, like we can go yes. like, I don't know. See, yeah, everything's yeah. a public record. Okay, that's so why you want referral. You know which contractor went to the court and then. Yeah, you want, you, that's why you want a referral on a good contractor. And there's more good contractors out there than bad. Oh, you yeah. Know, that's, yeah. That's, that's for sure. Uh, but, you know, that's my part of the job is the enforcement. I'm the chief of inspections and enforcement for Howard County. And okay. it's, uh, and, you know, we, we have our tools to make contractors move. And I always say we have more good contractors than bad contractors. So what's the turnaround to make? I mean, sometimes the contractors say, oh, you know, need an inspection. You know, we're waiting for the inspection. No. We're okay. back. It's going to take days. Or <coughs> we're, we're, you call for inspection today. You have it tomorrow. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Sorry. Actually, it's rare that we don't. Sometimes we run into that. I can set limits if we have people sick or so forth. But usually it's a... a 24 hour turnaround. Oh. Yeah. If an in, if inspector, excuse me, if a contractor's telling you that the inspection group is holding off, that's yeah. an untruth. Oh. That's, that's a lie. You know, but we don't do that. And and we're available to call, you know, you know eight hours a day with there, sometimes a little longer. But uh, we we're, we're pretty efficient. Oh, thank you. And we have a director that keeps us efficient. And, it makes for a pleasant operation, you know, we don't get behind. Because if we get behind, there's another way the inspections come behind that, so it's constant How does the homeowner know what needs to be inspected? I okay, there. Asking the model, and only one contract even mentions inspections. Okay, the only inspections depends what you're building, but basically uh, the inspections are listed on the county website if you went to Dill. Uh, I think Amanda's got some paperwork over there that has all this list. There, there's a QR there's code forms and fees, and there's a list of all the inspection codes and all the different yeah, types of no, Sometimes it's a mystery, you know, like, I, I've been around this so long that it's, uh, everything seems such a routine. Um, you know, like I said, I've got a son that still runs a building business, and, you know, he's very involved in it. Uh, and, but that uh, handout has pretty much everything you need to know. And my business cards are over there also. If anybody wants to pick them up, give me a call. If you have any questions, I'll certainly answer it. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, like I said, from your side of the view, you know, it's different you know, than my side. You know, like I tell everybody at work, I work on the contractor side of that counter all the time. And you know, I know the procedures. And, and, and we try and protect the public, you know, that's the purpose of our inspections is to make the job safe, uh, make everything correct. You know? That sounds oxymoron if the, if the fault falls on the homeowner. No, yeah, and I'll tell you why it falls on the homeowner. Because the homeowner owns the property. If we have a fine out there that's $10,000, uh, the judge orders it to be paid. We collect it off. We can put a lien against the homeowner's property. A lot of times, contractors are hard to track down. Now, we we do go after contractors mostly on the mechanical <coughs> trades, the electrical, plumbing, and the HVAC, because they've got a separate license. They don't. Their license jeopardized. So what happens there? Um, you know, you know, we've had 
there's license contractors who've paid out of county big fees to settle a dispute. But we do have the option to go after the homeowner. Because you own the property, and I'll tell you why, because you it's your right to make that decision to hire that contractor. That's true. It's not but ours. It seems like we're I'm I'm sitting here know, asking you like who even closes the permit loop? Like Okay, we, I didn't know that as a as a homeowner trying to yeah and that and that's the purpose for part of this you know, so meeting here tonight. So we have to supervise We, we, want, we well, want everybody. Did you know that? We want everybody to understand. There's an initial permit. There might be a footing inspection. There might be a, a drain tile, yeah. backfill, uh, one one inspection, slab inspection, framing inspection, it's uh, wall inspection. Did we get those inspection. information from the inspection yeah, website? Yeah, we, we give it to you. It's, it's, it's on that website. Okay. And, it, and the contractor is supposed to promote, post that permit on site. And that permit will have our information on there too, you, where you can call. And you should never pay a contractor so you see a final inspection. <laughs> you know, you know, some contractors are famous, as Dave said, you know, there's a maximum down payment of 30%, or 33%, 30%, I guess. Um, I know full contractors are famous. They take a big lump sum up front and leave 10% at the end. So they drag out that job, and you, you, know, you want your pool finished for June, July, and they're pushing out to September, October, and you lose a season. But that's one thing unique, in my opinion, about full contract. And not to put it on you here, Tom, but there, so if, if a permit is pulled for your property, mm -hmm. we have a public mm -hmm. database. Uh, the website is myhoward.info. That'll take you to our citizens' access portal. That's where contractors are applying for permits. That's where homeowners are applying for permits. And so it's actually on one of the packets. You picked up the packet from our table there. But you can actually track all of the inspections that are going on. That is all public information. So if for whatever reason you didn't see an inspection sticker on the property and you didn't trust that something occurred, you can go to that website and you can see whether or not that inspection occurred and the result. That is all public information. So do you keep all the permits uh, data, like for example, the house, like I'm buying a house and then I want to make sure the date has pulled a permit. Well, but the house being like maybe 20 years. So rehabilitation well, schedules are, are, we have records back to 2006 when our database switched. If it is prior to 2006, um, more than likely, we do not. There okay. are certain things, construction drawings and things like that, the county has a, a retention schedule and we are required to keep certain things for certain periods of time and it varies based upon what it is. But, but so 2006, we're coming up on that 20 year long. Okay. But if a basement was put in 10 years ago on a house and it wasn't permitted, we would have a record of that. Correct. And you could ask the real estate agent is everything on this house permitted? You know, then you throw the obligation to them. I don't know if they have any disclaimers out there now because it's getting to be an issue um, about unpermitted work. And more, most real estate companies are well aware of that today because they've been liable, proven liable for you know, things that the fire board wasn't aware of that was built without permits. And it was faulty work. You know, it's it the good work built without permits you never hear about. It's the bad one. And the bad guys always make it tough for the good guys. So what happened if homeowner become very handy and decided well, to? Well, you can. You can, you can put your own flooring down. You can yeah. add your own sheetrock. You can insulate. Um, and then they hire have, an electrician to do that and, part. And you can hire an electrician to do wiring. Howard County, I don't know if it's unique to all counties, but you can do 15 or 20 amp circuits in Howard County. Now, we require that the homeowner who wants to do that come and take a, a test that our um, electrical supervisors uh, put together uh, to show that you're qualified to do that. Wow. And the same with plumbing. You can do plumbing in Howard County on your own house, on your own project, yeah. without a permit. We, I mean, excuse me, you're required to get a permit, but it's a homeowner's permit. We have a homeowner's electrical permit. You know, you want to change faucets in your house, or anything like that, or remove, remove and replace a vanity. Yeah. You do not need a permit for that plumbing or building. 
we're not making it just replace you know, you upgrade, want a replacement upgrade. part, mm -hmm. replace the receptacle in the wall. We don't care about that. We don't have time to get involved with that. You, you can always call or email us and ask if yeah, your yeah. scope of work requires a yeah. You know, if you're doubtful, it might be good to hire an electrician, but the, you know, the, the homeowner has some rights to do fit work on your own property. You know, you can paint, you can remove and replace drywall. We don't care if you strip the whole house to the drywall. Yeah, as, 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 as long as it's your primary residence. Uh, yeah, as long as your primary residence. Really now, scary. if you're a house flipper so doing something else, pull the house and okay. remodel it and sell it. Uh, we require that person to have an NHIC license if they do not do that. Uh, again, to protect the consumer. We try, we're not always successful, but there's always people dodging and out of the walls. So, like the water heater, if the owner replaced the electric water heater, they need to. Use they do need a permit. Permit. And that's relatively new. If you replace the electric hot water heater, because the new code requires a fan under that hot water uh -huh. heater, the drain. Uh, it also requires an expansion yes. tank yeah. on an electric hot water heater. Yes. Previously, it was just gas hot water heaters. Well, now it's all water. All water heaters. What about expansion. those the tankless? No, uh, it still needs a permit. Still needs electrical permit and a plumbing permit. Okay. Uh, tankless, if it's air gas appliances, require a permit. Uh, again, public safety, because a lot of time the gas service coming in is not the divine required to service all the gas appliances in the house. That's why we have qualified inspectors to verify that. And it should be done by the contractor who sells you the gas hot water heater or gas stove, whatever it may be. I think the safe bet is when in doubt, call. Ask them what needs permit from the trust office. Mm -hmm. The man has a staff there all day long and we answer questions all day long. And it's easy to answer questions before the project and after. But okay. even if you know, it is online, where you can look up the inspection history. Everything requires permits all the way through and requires that final permit, no matter what kind of trade it is, whether it's electric, plumbing, HVAC, or building, they still need a final inspection in all of those. And, and we track them. We, we go after, we, uh, we have a database, we collect an aging permit list. Uh, if we have inspections that are so old that have not had an inspection, we contact the homeowner, we contact the contractor, and we try to get a result and get there and inspect it. It's tedious, but we do do that. Yeah, so so I guess the HVAC is the same, right? Because yes. I have a licensed uh, guy to come replace the HVAC right? mm -hmm. system, whole system. Do we need to apply for he, he's, your they are licensed. He's licensed, he should be applying for permits. You know, for the for the furnace equipment for uh, yeah, there's, home, for, there's no changes. Just take the you know old one and put a new one. Right, usually there's no change, but especially gas appliances, we find mistakes all the time. They invent venting the flues. And, oh, um, okay. Yeah, we do find errors. I'm surprised how many problems we do find. So what's the turnaround time? If I'm like, I need to replace the, uh, it's a home and we go apply. Well, if you hire. Uh, whatever the HVAC contractor is, right. you know, when you sign a contract with yes. a contract with me, yes. it should say in that contract that he's applying for permits. Oh, now, I apply the permit. No, you don't have to. Your licensed contractor should apply for that permit. What are you guys' thoughts on finding contractors through like websites like Nextdoor and things like that? I find like sometimes I put questions on there and I'll get a lot of good suggestions, but now I'm looking to do a bathroom remodel. Mm -hmm. And so I would go out there and say, anybody have any good? But then I noticed there are people that are looking to get business and they're like, hey, contract, contact me. Fun. Yeah, this is my MHIC. And you you look at some things on like next door on like how good of a contract they are, but you don't know. To Department of Labor's website. Okay. Check out MHIC contract. Mm -hmm. Dave said you call his office. Okay. These people will tell you if there's uh, outstanding violations with that contractor. Okay. You know, if, and like you said, they don't reissue the license if they've got you know, unresolved issues with the contract. Okay. Yeah, no, ultimately, we are tied in with the Department of Labor's database. 
if the contractor goes to apply and they don't have a license, that's going to be a red flag yeah, they, to us and we'll, they we're going to require on the intake yeah, contractor information permit. before it's even accepted um, and then reviewed and then ultimately issued and Tom Stack goes out and inspects it. So if you ever had a question things. about it, mm -hmm. you would want to verify with the MHIC board because okay. that's ultimately what we are going by. So is the same rule applied to all counties, like the PG County, Montgomery County, or only Holly County, or different separate? We do, they're very similar, I would say. Well, we do transmit uh, licensing data every night, every night, mm -hmm. whatever time, everybody's to all the local jurisdictions. Okay. So they have the data, whether they use the data. Or not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Howard County does have a rule, so separate so electrical registration that we do. Because um, the state of Maryland. Right, but, yeah. but we do go, for, so for home improvement projects, we go by the NHIC license for Plumbing, we're going by you know the master plumber's license. Um, HVAC, we're going by the master's HVAC license through the state. The only one that's different is the electrical registration. So if, if an electrician is doing work in Howard County, they are required to have an electrical registration for our department. They're required to have a state license that we Which, exactly. we no longer license than we used to, but the state changed them all to that. Yeah, because I, I run into an electrician, he said, yeah, license in uh, Howard County or Baltimore County, but he doesn't want, doesn't go venture out to Montgomery County, so he doesn't... Well, he I, doesn't I guess, have to be licensed there. Individual counties do require different things, but now the state only requires that they do a license. Oh, okay, because he told me, he said, Oh, you know, each county had to pay my uh, red. Well, they rate. have to pay a registration fee, I'm sure. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, no. we can't entirely speak for other counties. Yeah, I'm not sure but yeah, if you're worried, if you have questions about Montgomery County, call their Department of Permitting Services. Yes. So it's the same way, like somewhat, potentially, potentially. And the one thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with trades, um, the apprentice license doesn't necessarily mean that they can do the work unsupervised and a lot of business owners only have an apprentice license so whenever you hire a trades person make sure they have the right level of license so it may be in some way they know how to ask <laughs> well, yeah. worst comes to worst you start with our office and we can get you to the right place um, and i don't know if you were done but i wanted to make sure we were um, getting in. No, I'm, I'm finished with my uh, apologize. We asked. No, this no, is I... really important, and that's why we were holding this, but, you know, I just want to be aware of your time with folks that are watching online. Um, but please, after the program, if you do have additional questions, we're all going to hang out um, and so we can uh, do that. But I did want to invite Marsha and Taylor, if, our, if you guys want to come up. They do some um, amazing work, and this is, you know, depending on your situation, they can help you pay for your home improvement. And so that's, you know, when it comes to budgeting, it's a huge issue, but maybe they can help alleviate some of that burden. Thank you so much, Tom. So we can get business talk from you. They're right there on the table. Wait, wait, thanks. I'm moving happy to answer the questions. Yes. Hi, this is Jane uh, my name is Taylor Shelton. I'm from Howard County's Department of Housing and Community Development. And um, once you're ready to start your renovations, we can help you fund it. Um, our program is called the Reinvest, Renovate, Restore program. Um, and it is for eligible Howard County homeowners only. So we do have an income chart and the income chart is in the back. So that's the most important thing to know first. Um, we go up to 80% of Howard County's AMI, um, and it, it's based off of your household size. So I can tell you if you qualify or not, more or less, um, and then you can apply with me. Um, I would take your proof of income mm -hmm. uh, first with the application, it's about four pages. Um, the whole process is, it has a bunch of steps because we fund your project, but we also, um, partly supervise it in a way. Um, we do have a renovation consultant that would follow along with the project. And um, like you were saying, it is paid out in draws. 
So we would do an inspection for the first draw, second draw, and third draw after the um, project has been completed. Um, we actually just have uh, just have welcomed some new changes of, into the program. Um, it, we can now go up to fifty thousand dollars in uh, funding. So it was forty thousand at the beginning of the program, and now uh, we change it to fifty. And depending on your income, uh, there is an option for a forgivable loan. Um, typically, for the loans, if it is not in the forgivable or deferred portion, um, a lot of people end up paying around like $140-ish a month, um, and it is a 0 to 2% interest rate, so it's super helpful, um, a lot better than the market rates, um, you know, loans that you could get from the bank. But the homeowners still have to go find their own contract. That's right, yeah. And they, they have to buy the sign contract, proposals, apply permits, everything before mm -hmm. we apply. Yeah, so everything that they were saying about the contractors still goes into play. You have to find your own contractor because the Department of Housing is not liable for it if anything goes wrong um, with the contractor. Um, but, you know, the contractor is still responsible for writing up the, um, you know, the, the whole contract and mm -hmm. spelling out how much it would be. But that's where the renovation consultant's role comes in. Um, they're kind of a mediator, since I won't be there to oversee the actual project. They're there to, um, you know, do the draws. They do inspections to make sure everything is going smoothly, and they're the ones that approve us to give out the payments. When you say they do an inspection, that's different from. The oh yeah, it's totally different. It has nothing to do with that specifically. They go in and they look to make sure that whatever was on the original scope of work has been completed for that portion of the project. And who, whether it all passed the inspections, all the It's not the same and... type of inspection as what they do. It's a completely separate type of inspection. They're just looking over the work. Are there other programs within the county where a renovation consultant is, is available? I'm not sure. I don't believe so. Um, but yeah, for us, you know, we have it available. Something yeah definitely it's we um have HUD certified um renovation consultants they are with the federal government or i don't know how they've been certified specifically but they work with the federal government's uh rehab program so we pull them and they kind of know what to do from there i have a question so we can do it yeah for sure so it's pretty general um our program i have the flyers in the back of the room that you can grab um, as well as my business card, um, and I'm the one who's working on all the applications. So if you guys do choose to apply, you'll be talking to me directly. You can feel free to call me with specific questions. I know um, everyone's project is different. That's what's so interesting about home renovations. Like every new things come up every day. Um, so feel free to call me, and um, I'm accepting applications all the time. Um, I'll just reiterate again: you can get up to fifty thousand dollars in assistance, um, and then it is based on your. Uh, income so i can give you for example a household of two the maximum income would be eighty two thousand nine hundred and eleven dollars for the whole household um, of two people so when you say home renovation does that include so called that you know, addition oh that's a good question yeah so when i say home renovations we are really looking to help um you know improve the state of the home and we want to make sure that people are able to stay in a safe environment so we're not necessarily looking at cosmetic repairs it's going to be um you know like the urgent things like roofing windows big projects that people really need assistance with um but yeah so you have a list of what qualified to okay. mm -hmm. yeah we have a list okay thanks That was it for me. Thanks, guys. Hi, um, my name is Marcia White. I am the operations manager for Rebuild Together Howard County. And we've been working, uh, we're a nonprofit. We've been working in Howard County since 1902. We were formerly um, Christmas in April. Uh, we were a once a year organization. We, uh, we have a giant uh, uh, volunteer uh, event once a year and we would work on homes of uh, low-income homeowners in Howard County. But for about the last 10 years we've been um, uh, year-round uh, staffed nonprofit and uh, again we offer free home repairs for low-income uh, Howard County homeowners. Uh, the repairs that we do are 
meant to uh, keep uh, homeowners safe in their homes. Again, like um, Taylor said, we're not, it's not a cosmetic uh, repairs that we're looking at. We're looking at repairs that keep homeowners safe in their homes. Uh, for example, uh, we do roofs, um, HVAC replacements, um, plumbing, electrical, uh, uh, anything uh, safety related um, uh, that, that, that we can help a, a homeowner with. Uh, to qualify for our program, uh, you must be uh, low income. And that number varies depending on how many people live in the home, but our average uh, family income is $30,000 a year. Um, we also have to uh, live in the county, uh, own your home, uh, be current on your taxes, have homeowners insurance, and that's about it. Uh, we do a lot of modifications for folks that are aging in place. We do uh, we do uh, ramps, stair glides, mm -hmm. grab bars, comfort height toilets, uh, walk in, step in, um, tub conversions. Now that's keeping us very busy because a lot of folks are really trying to stick, uh, stay at home for as long as possible. So. We do a lot of work with them. Um, we also have uh, urgent repairs. So people that find, you know, um, in all this rain we've been having and their roof fails uh, and they need help right away, um, we're in a position to help them quickly as well. Uh, the work that we do is done by uh, licensed contractors. We hire a lot of licensed contractors. Um, we also do a lot of uh, mobile home re uh, repairs along the Route 1 corridor uh, in, uh, cooperate, uh, in tandem with the, with the county. Um, Department of Community Resources and Services. Um, we do have a big event coming up April 27th. It's our largest event of the year. We are going to be helping uh, 20 homeowners with 500 volunteers on that day and um, it's going to make a big difference for a lot of folks who need help. So if you um, know anyone that uh, is struggling, that needs uh, you know, critical repairs to their homes, they can apply on our website, which is rebuildingtogether.org, um, or we can mail an application to them directly. And we have a flyer in the back too, if um, you know anybody that could use our help. So how can you volunteer? Uh, well, uh, you can sign up on our website to volunteer. I, I mean, we want to be receiving, but also we're not going to give it. Yeah. Give it, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's always two sides. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we have a, a place on our website where you can Sign up. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, thank you um, to Dave, Tom, Amanda, uh, Taylor, and Marsha um, for such an amazing program. Thank you to the audience and those that are watching. If you have follow up questions, I have placed an email in the comments and I will be happy to route your questions to the speakers. Um, for those that are here, please uh, take the time, visit the tables, there's a lot of resources here. And if you have additional questions, um, how much longer, you guys can stay a little bit longer, right? Um, so feel free to stay and um, get all of your questions answered. And if there's anything I can answer, I will be here as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.